Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to, to come into your house, Lord, this morning. You are a holy God, and we, we bow in your presence. Father, you've, you've blessed us so richly as we come this morning to give back a small portion of what you've given to us, Father. We commit it to your service, and we pray that we be used to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congregation, the Lord is good? All right, well, here's what we're going to do. You're going to do the special this morning. Um, we're going to play for you. And you're going to sing out. And you're going to sing about how good the Lord is. I don't think you can sit down and sing this song, but if, if you can. Uh, but let's praise the Lord this morning.
praise team. Hey, man. I, that, I will have to start wearing my shirt tail out now. And try to loosen me up a little bit. Well, as you know, many of you, most of you, all of you, this has been quite an extraordinary weekend. Um, the Nicole Mullen concert and outreach has had a tremendous impact. We, we guess, we're not sure, the clickers kind of start on the inside building and stop in here. We, we were full both nights here and people were turned back to the park. Uh, first night was probably over 1,200 present. I'm not, I'm not sure about Saturday night, but it was a huge crowd, and, and, uh, but way beyond numbers, and, and even beyond the concerts. I said both nights we worshiped the Lord, yes. and God spoke and moved, yes. and it, it's just been a precious, precious yes. experience. Now, we're going to say more as we close the service, but I want us to continue the weekend. Would you welcome Nicole Mullen?
why would he have hoped for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we will patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we well. ought. But the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the Lord God. And we know that all things work together for them, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the first one among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be for us? He that spared out his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified him. Who is he that condemned him? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also made the intercession for us? Who shall separate us yes. from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things, yeah. we are more than conquerors yeah. for him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, nor any other creature, nor any other creature, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 It's all about Him. It's for His glory, for His honor, for His praise. To God be the
extraordinary, extraordinary moment. Some of our children will never forget this weekend. Some of you old ones might, but, uh, <laughs> but it has something to do with the concert. <laughs> what an incredible, incredible time we've had together with Nicole and her team. And again, we'll express some appreciation at the conclusion of the service, but would you take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke's Gospel. Let the King of Glory come in. That's that word from the Old Testament psalm that Jesus is the King of Glory. And we just gave him praise. And the King of Glory entered Jerusalem. And they didn't recognize it. The people of Jerusalem missed Jesus. And we come to that moment today. It's actually in the beginning of this week as we approach the cross, there is that sense of uh, it was a somber sense. Even though, as we start reading, the palms, there's charity, you're going to find Jesus crying. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're found in verse 28 of the 19th chapter. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt, type of colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked, then why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teach and rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Yes. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now before I keep reading, that description was referencing the sermon last week when Jesus plainly told his disciples that Jerusalem will be destroyed, not one stone will be left on another. Speaking of a near prophecy that was fulfilled in 70 AD under Titus, Tacitus, the Roman historian, this is not a Bible teacher telling you this, Tacitus said, along with Josephus, but Tacitus said, 110,000 Jewish bodies were taken out of one gate alone after the destruction of Jerusalem. It was a horrible, horrible, historic event when Jerusalem was leveled. It was a bloodbath. And nothing was left but a remnant of people in the region. It would take another 50, 60 years for the Jewish people to cease to exist in the Palestine area. Some of you know the infamous battle of Masada. That was the last holdout of, of, of the Jewish people. And they were dispersed throughout the world. That's what's going on here. So once again, you're having Jesus talk about what's coming. So it was a very somber moment. No wonder he wept. But it's more than that, as we'll see. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It's written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple. That's Holy Week. Every day. In and out of the city. 
But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people, get this, they were trying to kill him. Yet, they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. His words. Would you be seated? Thank you. Here's the question. Do you recognize Jesus? Two possible meanings of that question. If I said, did you recognize him? I I'm asking, do, do you know who he is? You know, last night, with all the crowd, if you come up to me and say, did you see that person standing over there by the booth? Did, did, did you recognize that person? Maybe, maybe not. But you know what I mean when I say, did, do you recognize it or her? But there's another possible meaning in the way we use it is, did you recognize him? Did you recognize Nicole when she came up to sing for who she is? You know, Dove Award winning artist? No, I didn't because we know you, Nicole. We love you. But yes, she, she's been recognized in the music world. She is known across the globe for her music and her heart. We come to know you and love you too. But to recognize her is to, is to honor her, to, to give attention to who she is. So when I ask, do you recognize Jesus? I'm asking it in both senses of the word. Do you know who he is? Do you really know who he is? And secondly, have you recognized him in your life? Have you honored him, given him attention? The key passage that in these few minutes I want to focus on are found in 41 through 44. You need to read these with me again. Look at the character. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, now that's a plural. It's a singular for the city, but it's plural in the sense of all the people there. It's singular this morning for each of you, but it's plural for all of us. If we had only known on this day what would bring you peace, it's a, a Jewish understanding, shalom, of salvation, that's peace. Drop down. He said, they will dash you to the ground in your day of judgment. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another. Now watch the, the purpose clause or the result statement. Because, why would this happen? Why would God, who is good, as we say a moment, why would he let 75,000 up to a million people in that city suffer? There are all kinds of ranges of estimates. Tacitus said 110,000 Jewish bodies came out of one gate in the sea. Why would God let something like that happen? Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Father, help us with this text. It's not easy. As we step into your word, even as we step with Jesus, we follow him. Like the disciples, they may not have understood all of this. They, they struggled with his words, but they followed him into the gate and into the city and onto the cross. May we do the same today. Make us students of your word this morning. Help us to hang on every word you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus entered Jerusalem through the, what's called the East Gate, or the Golden Gate. I'm gonna use a series of pictures here to talk through something. Um, I want you to notice, the scripture says that when they begin to make their way down the road, off of the Mount of Olives, you're at the crest of the hill called the Mount of Olives. As you go over the crest, any of you been to Holy Land, you, you know what I'm talking about. That's what you see, that's it. You see, now that picture's small. I don't have a, a little pointer. But see the gold dome? Drop down below it and you see a wall. Now that is not the wall of the city of Jerusalem that Jesus saw. Because that wall's been rebuilt. But the base stones there, particularly down at this corner at the very end. The base stones and then on the back side of the gold dome mosque. On the back side of the mosque, there's a drop off of the Temple Mount. 
And that wall there is the Wailing Wall, and it is the original wall of Herod's Temple Mount. So when Jesus came over the ridge, he saw a city, some estimate up to a million people. And it had this look, though those are modern buildings in the back, everything in Jerusalem is built with a limestone, sandstone look. So it still had that same look. And there was a wall there. Now what you see here, and I wanted this picture, I want you to get an idea of the, when we say the Mount of Olives, we're not talking snow-capped mountains. We're talking hills. And see how they're rolling through here. In fact, the hill in the background is the Mount of Olives on the eastern side. Jesus, remember, we've been on a journey if you've been with us. We're coming up from the Jordan. It's 800 feet below sea level to 2,500 above sea level in Jerusalem. So we're, we're going up to Jerusalem, just like the scripture said. And as you approach from the east, you approach Jerusalem, you're going to come to the Mount of Olives. But right here is the modern city of Bethany. And Bethpage would be located just at the base of the Mount of Olives. So we're we're going to climb up to the top of the Mount of Olives. And when we go over the peak, give me the slide of Jerusalem. You have the city of Jerusalem. Now, that's when the scripture says Jesus wept. But something else happened there. Back up into the text and notice uh, in verse 37. This is so important for us to catch the sense of the crowd. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. Again, they came up and they went over. And as you go over the top of the Mount of Olives, the city is right there on the next hill. So the Kidron Valley is between it. It's a, it's a large area. It, it takes a while to walk. But there it is. And as they went over that ridge, the scripture says, the whole crowd began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Now, now, before that, as they're approaching the hill of Mount of Olives, they're throwing their coats on the ground. The other gospels talk about palm branches. Oh, the followers, that's us. We've been with him. And now the crowd's gathering. All the followers, all those who've seen all these miracles. Oh, they, they're, that's what it's about. He said, for the miracles they've seen, they didn't say anything about what they've heard, but the power of this man Jesus, surely he's the Messiah. And so as they, as they approach the Mount of Olives, they're throwing their coats down, they're taking these coats off. I'm, I am warm, so I'm going to take it off. <laughs> They throw it down there. And as they do that, it's honoring the Messiah. He's the king. It's just tradition there. They do that. And as they threw their coats down and waved the palm branches, as they moved over the top and saw Jerusalem, this is it. This is a big moment. There's the capital city. That's why they started. Look, what the Bible says that they begin to joyfully praise God in loud voices. Now they've gone from coats. Praise the Lord. Hosanna, be praised. And the crowd now multiply that. Everybody pick a phrase. You got a phrase in mind? Hosanna. Praise the Lord. Amen. What's some more? Hallelujah. Okay, on the count of three, I want you to yell out some phrase. I can tell this is not going to go well. <laughs> Just try it anyway. <laughs> One, two, three. Pray. Now what if that, you're pretty good. What if that just continued? And it's just human nature. It's just like us getting ready to go into the stadium. And the noise picks up. This is, it. This is the moment we've waited for. What are you talking about, Pastor? They were followers of Jesus. Please, they, they have heard him and they watched him for three years. And they're his followers. And they're gathering, entering the city. They're picking up some folks who've been on the edge. But what they're doing is cheering the Messiah who's going to take Jerusalem and bring back the glory of David's throne and take out the Romans and give us a better life. That's what the cheering is about. It's real. They're cheery. They really are followers. They just don't quite have it right yet. We hadn't got to the cross, remember. 
We've been on a journey to Jerusalem for a year and a half here in our church. Almost a year and a half. As we walk through the pages of Luke's gospel, they're giving us a very meticulous, careful presentation of what happened. This is what happened. I wanted you to see the pictures of Jerusalem because this is not fantasy. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some Bible moral story. You know, many people who come to church treat the stories of the Bible as good moral stories you want to tell your children. If that's all it is, you've missed God. You've missed Jesus totally. The stories are real. Yes, there are teaching stories, but this story is a story that happened and it's pointing us to who Jesus is and, and, and why he came. Because as he came over the ridge and they're cheering, Jesus is weeping. Now do you get the kind of contrast? And I think sometimes in our churches, we can all be up and excited and everything's wonderful because everything's going our way. But Nicole, like you said, but in the hard times, in the night moments, that's when it's real. That's when you know who Jesus is. And that's when you know him in his fullness. Because as they, as they went over the ridge and saw what they saw, and by the way, the inset, as we pointed out last week, that's actually what was there in the place of the dome. It was the, a wonder of the ancient world. There was no building in the world of the first century like Herod's temple. You would talk about it like they would talk about the towers of Dubai today. It was a wonder piece built by that Tyrant Herod, but he was a great architect. Th that was sitting there larger than the dome. It dominated the Jerusalem skyline. It represented all of Israel. It was their hopes, their dream. In spite of the Roman occupation and oppression, we still have our temple. And we're going to come back. And here's our Messiah that's been prophesied. He has come. And they were right. Jesus was the Messiah, is the Messiah. They just didn't have what he was coming to do, right? It's like us sometimes. We know who he is. We just miss what he's about in our lives. You remember Jesus told the disciples when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God? Absolutely right. The disciples knew Jesus was Messiah, Meshua, Yeshua, God's anointed one. They knew it. Next line, Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Why? Tell, him, tell the nations that Jesus is the Christ. Well, we, we are to do that. But first, he said, you don't understand why I've come. You know who I am, but you don't know what I'm about. Because in the next line, he said, listen, guys, ladies. And he said this three times over the, over the Gospel of Luke. I must go to Jerusalem, suffer, be killed, and on the third day rise again. He told them plainly. He repeated that two more times in their journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. You know what Peter said when he heard the words of the Lord, the Christ? He rebuked him. Can you imagine telling God you're wrong? Some of you do that, though, don't you? He said, no, Lord, that will not happen. It's a double negative in the Greek. It's in Matthew 16, clearly given there, at the Caesarea Philippi Confession. Peter said, you're the Christ. Jesus said, that's great, Peter. God revealed that to you. But don't tell anybody. Because I have to go to Jerusalem, suffer, die, and be raised on the third day. And you don't understand that because you have in mind the things of men and not the things of God. And that's what's happening here. This crowd, they knew him to be the Christ. They were right to put the palm branches and throw their coats down. He is worthy of our worship. But why was he entering Jerusalem? It was to give his life for us. And Jerusalem didn't recognize him. The disciples recognized him. They just didn't understand yet what he was about. It's foreshadowing our time. The disciples of Jesus know who he is. And we know what he's about. He's about the cross and the salvation of all men and women, boys and girls. He has come to seek and to save those who are lost. The cross is central to his mission. And he was raised from the dead. He's alive today. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. He's going to enter that same gate that we'll see in a moment. Jesus is coming back. We get that. But the majority of the world, they're like Jerusalem. And remember, 
or Jerusalem actually represents a religious establishment. Even religious people sometimes are so caught up in their rules and regulations and their rituals, they're more with the Pharisees than they are with the followers. Because the Pharisees said, Jesus, tell them to be quiet. Why do they say that? Because they were saying, you are God. Hosanna is meaning God save us. They had already heard Jesus claim to be God. God has come. In fact, as you look at the text, look at the last words of that key passage. You did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. God had come in Christ to reconcile the world. And the Jewish leaders missed it. Jesus said, well, look, if they don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out. The whole creation sings his praise. God is to be praised. And the religious leaders missed it. Why? And, and now I, I want to bring it to the focus. What happened to you? There's the line. They did not recognize the time of God's coming. Why the destruction of Jerusalem? It was because of their sin and their rejection of God. In their sin, they said no to the Savior and they suffered the rejection. By the way, he said, Pastor, where is their sin? Well, he went into the temple. They had turned temple worship into a mockery. It was a for-profit uh, enterprise going on. The weak, the poor, the widows of the land, even as we pictured last night, the, the people caught in sin, they were so, so abused and mistreated by the religious establishment. It was a, it was a wicked time. And Jesus exposed it. He cleaned house that day as he prepared for the cross. Again, foreshadowing what the cross will do in our hearts. Because when Jesus comes into the gate of your heart, he's going to claim the temple. Yeah. He's going to make you holy for the one who is holy. Yeah. So they didn't recognize him. What, what didn't they recognize? They didn't recognize who he was. They didn't recognize that Jesus is God. And they didn't recognize that he is the Christ. The followers did, not the masses. And there are some in this building right now. You've not recognized him. You don't know that Jesus is God come in the flesh to be the Savior of the world. He's not just some religious figure that you want to sing a nice song to. He is God among us. And He came to save His people from their sins. They didn't recognize that. And they would suffer judgment in the days ahead. They didn't, they didn't recognize what He said and what He did. Where were the people of Jerusalem? Had they not heard what He said and taught in the temples? In fact, if we kept going into chapter 20, they're going to question His authority. They're going to undermine His teaching. They were absolutely against what Jesus had to say. Have you picked that spirit up in our world today? Just mention the name of Jesus in your place of work or business and watch sometimes what the reactions are. Oh, you can give a, a good moral syllogism, a little something you ought to do, but attach the name Jesus to it and say it's His Word. People have rejected His Word. They didn't recognize His words. They didn't recognize what He did. He raised the dead. He walked on the water. He, he calmed the sea. He fed the thousands. Jesus proved Himself, demonstrated Himself over and over to be the one true God who's come to save us from our sins. They didn't recognize Him for who He was or what He said and did. And they didn't recognize why He came. He said, in that passage, he said they didn't recognize God's coming for you. That's why he wept, everyone. Don't think of God as this supreme being that's cold and just dis destroys people who are sinners. Jesus crested the mount when he saw Jerusalem, his heart broke. In fact, Matthew records that Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I'm going to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. And here he says, you didn't recognize me. You wouldn't let me in. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bow your knee to who I am. You rejected me, is what he's saying. Why did Jesus come? He came for you and me. He came for us to save us from our sins. Matthew said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to show the gate for me there. If we could put the gates up. This is actually the eastern gate today. Now the top part's been rebuilt. It's been rebuilt several times over the centuries. But down at the base, again, you have the base of the old Jewish wall. And that's where the eastern gate was. But in the 7th century, uh, excuse me, the 15th century, the Muslims who occupied Jerusalem knew the Jewish prophecy that Messiah would come through that gate. And the Jews are looking for Messiah to come, and he's going to go through that gate. So the Muslims of the day stoned it up so he couldn't come through to shut down the Jewish prophecy. In fact, let me have one more picture of it. Not only did they seal up the gates, at the base of the gates, they built a cemetery. Yeah, the Messiah is not going to walk through a cemetery. They don't know our Jesus. <laughs> he raises the dead. He's going to go right through those gates. He's already been through the gates, everyone. He is Messiah. They missed it according to the prophet Ezekiel. But there's coming a day again, near and far. Jesus says he's coming, he's coming again. We, we read that last week in the lengthy, lengthy passages. But the Son of Man will come again. He will set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And he will bring in his eternal kingdom as King of kings and Lord of lords. I've had to rush through some notes. But you get it, don't you? It's salvation for those who recognize Him. It is judgment for those who don't. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, but it's been rebuilt. But even now, in the Middle East, the forces are moving, and behind that force, the evil forces are moving, surrounding Jerusalem according to prophecy that Jerusalem will once again be hemmed in on every side. And once again, there will be an attack against the holy city. But this time, Jesus will return and will destroy the enemies of God. And there will be a recognition by Jerusalem and the Jewish people of the Messiah, they have pierced. And they will give Him praise. In fact, there won't be a problem at the return of Christ with recognition. The Bible says at that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Say it with me. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Would you stand with me? Do you recognize Him today? Do you recognize Jesus is God come to us to be our Savior? And have you recognized Him in your life? Have you given Him the worship that's due Him? Have you invited Him into the temple of your heart? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? That's the message here. Jesus weeps for those who reject Him. But the Bible gives us this principle. God will not always strive with man. He'll speak, He calls, He woos, he shows himself strong and love and holy and caring. But there comes a point when you've rejected him when it's too late. That day is moving up on us as a world with the return of Christ. It'll be too late then for salvation. For those who know Christ, it will be the beginnings of eternity with him. Do you know Jesus? Father, in these moments, call us. Call us to be those who are in the crowd with Jesus, giving him praise and honor. An understanding, Father, now, in view of the cross and the resurrection, understanding that you've called us to follow Jesus, to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses, and to follow him. Thank you, Lord, for what you're saying this morning. We trust you now for this public invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, the altar is open for you to come. Some will come publicly today saying, I've trusted Christ on the weekend. And I want to follow the Lord. I want to follow them in baptism, believer's baptism. Some of you say, you know, Pastor, we've been at this church a while. But we sense this is where God wants us to be a part of the body of Christ. You come in obedience to Him. Come a part of this church's family. Come share that with the pastor here. You come as we sing.
want you to come step out now. The music is starting. The altar is here. If you just like a time of prayer, you come say, Pastor, I, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to recognize him in my life. We'll pray together with you. You come. Someone's coming. Others are. You come. You have shown me. of the whole church to say we love you and we thank you for being faithful to share God's love and the gospel with us this weekend. Blessings. All right. Everybody? signing autographs, taking pictures, but not just that, speaking with each person who came to her, and uh, that touched us, that you would do that.
that. And here, this represents that. That is special. Sharon, you have to stand up one more time. Uh, we'll back this line up right here. Uh, I want you, a couple of girls, come this way, Sharon. Would you give her a hug? Let's thank Sharon real Sharon led our National Missions Committee in bringing Nicole and her team here with us. And we do thank you, Sharon, and your team. I want all of that 100 plus volunteers. Would all of you stand? Let's give an expression of appreciation. Remain standing. And then we have all of those who engaged in prayer support for this effort. Would you stand? That may be the most all of us. Would you stand? And then. We have, we have several vendors here who supported us, helped us, gave. If you're here, would you stand? Let's, let's appreciate it. Now, you may be seated except for this group. And we're about through. Tasha, come stand with me here. This is Tasha Ebanks Garcia. She spoke to me last night after concert got it deeply moved in her life in a recommitment of her life to Christ having uh, been baptized uh, uh, excuse me I had that backwards wanting to be baptized as an expression of her faith she comes today desiring membership in our church Amen. on believers baptism if you're thrilled to talk to her. morning, tears flowing in her heart and life, and she wants today to become a part of our church fellowship on her uh, profession of faith and baptism. She has uh, come to Christ already, but she comes today to be part of our church family. Yeah. Church membership, if you're thrilled, let her know. You did no. Since you did so well a moment ago, we're going to close with this little object lesson. Kind of look back toward the door, everybody. Kind of look back. And just in your imagination, remember the phrase you yelled out a moment ago. This time, I want you to let it go about three or four times. And I want you to imagine the day that Jesus comes back. Would you give him praise? One, two, three.